Eh, introduco adesso con piacere Diva Tommei, eh, direttore investimenti IT, ICT, Ainea Tech, founder di C and CEO di Solenica e anche appena nominata membro di Donna 4.0, congratulazioni. So I just said uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Diva Tommei, which she is director of investment at IT, ICT, Enea Tech, founder and CEO of Solenica, and just nominated member of uh, Donna 4.0. She is going to speak about technologies of the future, investments, impact, and ethics. So Diva, um, thank you. you thank you so much. Eight, um, ten minutes, okay? Sure. Yeah. I hope you can hear me. Yes, right? we can. Okay. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for the kind uh, introduction and for giving me the opportunity to uh, do a little bit of a sort of a brainstorming on something that I uh, have always felt was really, really important. Um, let me start by saying that I think today we are living at a crossroads with many new deals coming about that are necessary from the policy standpoint as well as the technology standpoint in order for um, you know, modern society, modern civilization to keep doing well on this planet for generations to come. So when we say New Deal, we immediately think of the Green New Deal in the US, it's equivalent in Europe, and even internationally with the COP26 conference taking place in Glasgow just last week, we have a clear uh, concept on the sustainability uh, sort of part of this new deal. But um, I think another new deal that is ushering in is uh, what I like to call a new deal on data. Now, why is a new deal on data necessary? Um, well, technology often accelerates us in a direction much faster than we are anticipated and in directions that uh, are not necessarily uh, at times directions we even understand when we start on the journey, right? And it's hard for us at times to understand what is happening on a societal scale. Um, but with data having become undeniably the next currency, uh, we need to start paying extra attention today to this topic. Why? So let's, let's think about this. On, on the one side, um, we have a digital divide that is affecting minorities and women greatly because some parts of this planet are simply not connected. Um, and in the ones that are, low ICT skills remain a barrier to meaningful participation in today's society, which is a digital society. So we have this participation access issue on one side. On the other, we have yet to find um, a winning model for using data in a way that favors everyone, I would say, and exploits no one. So again, uh, issue of participation and access on one side. On, on the other side, we have an issue with the way the data of the people who do and are able to participate is used and what it is used for. Um, uh, broadband access is a technology that I, I would say we could, uh, we could say is as vital to a um, fair chance for life in the 21st century as probably we can consider electricity uh, was for the 20th century. But uh, broadband, much like in the early ages of electricity, is still considered a luxury today rather than an essential service. So if, if we try and readopt those goals of universal access that we did adopt when we were uh, trying to distribute equally water, electricity, the, the road systems, but giving it a specific focus on the 21st century access, which by definition is internet access, um, we can probably start making a difference in this debate and think of bringing internet back to its, you know, egalitarian roots. Um, so new, new deep tech uh, technologies are definitely coming to the rescue on one side because, you know, we can think of low orbiting satellites, uh, underwater internet, sort of connecting those parts of the planet that are remote or still unexplored. But the real issue is that there is, uh, in my opinion, no unifying vision to address this digital divide because uh, all the multi-stakeholders that are involved have not sat at the table yet together to discuss it. 
So think governments, tech giants, civil society, non-governmental organizations, uh, they haven't sat at the table together yet and had an honest debate about this. So we can ask technology to go, you know, let's call it from, from deep tech to deep purpose, right? Giving purpose through technology. But this is still not a unified vision because it's a unilateral vision. And so until we do really uh, go and have this debate, honest debate within our society on how we want to move forward on this topic of data access and data sovereignty, we are not anywhere close to where we need to be. Just a, a brief look at the numbers, right? Uh, if we look at the numbers, we can see that ICT has become and will continue to be a um, dominated drive, dominating driver of economic growth um, as new technologies join in and generate new impact. So if we look at worldwide ICT spending, we will see that it has grown by uh, approximately 5% every year since the financial crisis in 2009. Now, traditional IT and telco markets, they now represent uh, an increasingly mature sector and they are projected to broadly track GDP over the next decade, so up until 2030. Uh, with new technology categories, however, so IoT, robotics, AR, VR, AI, 3D printing, driving a dramatic acceleration in the growth of the industry. So these technologies are expected over the next five to 10 years to account for over a quarter of ICT spending. So we have traditional ICT spending that is still expected to broadly track GDP growth over the next decade, but these new technologies taking larger and larger shares of the market. So uh, effectively bringing the tech sector to once again grow uh, two to three times faster than, than overall economy by 2030. Now, if we look at this contextual uh, situation, there is a lot of pressure we could say on the big tech companies to respond to a, a necessary shift from the current harvest and hoard model, model uh, of, for data to a personal data sovereignty model. So what has been their response so far? So far, there has been the data transfer project, which was launched in 2018 by Google, a white paper by Google, that today has gotten um, Microsoft, Twitter, Facebook, Apple involved as well. Uh, and, uh, but not much has come out of this project so far. Uh, it, although if you go on their website, uh, companies can adhere to this common framework with open source code, if they want to, and start, um, you know, working towards the goal of giving individuals across the web, uh, the ability to easily move their data between online service providers, whenever they want, this is their objective. Um, of course, usability and as a constant consequence, achieving critical mass is really the only way for consequential adoption to take place. Um, so, so we need, we could say that we need a set of technology standards that developers can use to write programs and entrepreneurs and businesses can use to build markets. And these standards should allow companies to gain access to a person's data with their permission via secure links for specific tasks. Uh, but um, use personal information selectively, not store it. Another very interesting model that is being brought forward by Tim Berners-Lee, who invented the World Wide Web in 1989 when he was at CERN uh, and launched, I think, in 1991, the first uh, browser outside of CERN. Uh, according to Lee, these tech giants uh, that he calls silos have become surveillance platforms and gatekeepers of innovation because they are fueled by troves of data that nobody else has. And so even though regulators hit them with antitrust suits and antitrust, we can argue has been an effective regulation tool in the past in other industries, think of food industry, semiconductors, the answer according to Lee is to develop a new technology that gives individuals more power through personal online data stores, P-O-D-S, pods, he calls them pods. So the idea here is that each person can control his or her own data through these pods. So you think, you know, when, which websites you visited, credit card purchases, workout routines, music streamed, and trusted organizations will initially be the sponsors of these pods. And then once the concept takes off, low cost and free um, personal data services like today's email will start emerging. So if a, if a model like this takes off, 
uh, starting, which has started, we can say, as a, a privacy issue and has pushed to give individuals greater control over their data, even though this was its inception, it will inevitably, inevitably take over the rest of the uh, economic processes that build our society. And it will start requiring that entrepreneurs, engineers, investors, they start seeing opportunities for new products and services, just like um, what happened with the World Wide Web. And, and the internet. Um, so central to both of these models are two principles, data portability, data interoperability. Uh, they are the two future, future principles that will be central to fueling the innovation of the future if we want to have the level of innovation that um, our society will require in order to stay, you know, democratic and egalitarian. So it, internet access, I, I think we could, uh, just to conclude, we can say that it has become a cornerstone of modern civilization. And as a society, I think we need to start having an honest debate on how we want our future to look like as a consequence of this reality that we are living in. So do we want this opportunity to end up dividing us more? Or are we going to use it as a lever to change what has not worked so far? So I'll, I'll leave you with this open question. I don't have the answer, but I, I hope that I was, you know, at least um, giving you a, a bit of a, a sure. sparkle uh, something to think about. So th thanks for listening and happy to, to open up the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. I think there is one question, uh, at least from yes. uh, your speech, Diva, uh, made me thinking and excited me uh, when you mentioned. Let's find a unifying vision. Let's yeah. find a vision to exploit data in a, a way which uh, is uh, fitting public general interest. Uh, the second speech today, we heard that uh, at uh, the European level, they look for some set of data about therapies and so on. That is one example of uh, criteria which have been used, but uh, which, uh, in my view, should be tested against the collective judgment. So your speech made me thinking that the way forward may be is to consider and use the experience that we have had uh, in the last 30 years in the field of uh, infrastructures. If digital infrastructures are critical, they should be uh, planned, designed, maintained, used as much as highways, railways, and the like. Hence, it should follow an environmental impact assessment, a social impact assessment, a process of stakeholders' engagement, and so on. This is a very uh, shift in paradigm because uh, so far, the digital industry has been a, a do it among uh, industry and users and uh, not uh, a, a plain field uh, with state uh, public agencies involved. That's my suggestion. I, would, I, wish uh, I, I think you're absolutely you. correct. Yes. Absolutely. Um, we, uh, we need to have this concept of universality, um, you know, brought to the world of digital. And today, even though you know, we may not exactly feel this because we are definitely living in the, the part of the world that is more connected and has more access to uh, ICT formation and education. Um, you know, we are, we are kind of um, making um, a, a bigger and bigger gap between us and the people who are still lagging behind and who, you know, they're, they're still in the electricity wave trying to get electricity. So we really need to take this opportunity uh, to, to think about this and how we want to move forward, because this is, is a real game changer, I feel, uh, for the future generations. And, um, um, sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but there is something, there is a question that it's right in, in this, um, following your words, in fact, is uh, uh, how do you think it is possible to sit government, tech giants, et cetera, at the same table? think about uh, what kind of society we want, right? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, you have a, just a, like a 15 seconds to answer? A brain <laughs> well, I, 
Well, you know, I think that uh, in the past, what has been used as a tool that, what, that this relatively blunt tool, right, uh, has been the antitrust. But, uh, and, and it has worked in the past to um, fuel uh, industries that have taken over the world. Think of semiconductors, right? So, but it, we are at a point where um, I think we've, we've passed to the point where antitrust could actually have an impact. This was probably in the Barack administration that happened, and, and it action was not taken. So we've gone a little bit farther, and at this point, I think the only way is is to really organize a COP twenty six like, uh, you know, debate, international debate, and have this be a, another uh, very important issue that we have to uh, we have to talk about uh, in in. That's, uh, I like the idea of, uh, of, of a digital cop. That's uh, a very nice <laughs> yeah, idea. So I, I thank you very much for your thank speech. You. It was really interesting. And 